Hello, my name is Mark Reed. I am a professor of interdisciplinary environmental research at Birmingham City University. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about how we can engage the people who are affected by land degradation in decisions about how they and us may be able to work together far more effectively to find new solutions to the challenges posed internationally by land degradation. The challenges posed by land degradation internationally are vast. Land degradation affects vast swathes of land, which has environmental consequences for species and habitats that have nowhere else to live. Then there are knock-on effects for the local communities and wider human populations who depend upon those natural resources, whether directly or indirectly, with effects on their health and well-being and their ability to earn a livelihood. Increasingly, however, we are waking up to the economic realities of doing nothing about land degradation. And as the international policy community wake up to this reality, there is an increase in activity in the research community to try and come up with new ways of tackling these previously intractable problems. The problem is that the scientific community don't always have a great track record of getting these kinds of things right. We can all think of examples of great scientific endeavours that went badly wrong and had unintended consequences. And so the scientific community are increasingly being encouraged and trying to work hand in hand with the communities who were affected by land degradation to jointly come up with new ideas and ways of tackling these problems together. So the topic of today's session is to think really how can we effectively engage these local communities and people who have a really intimate knowledge of their local environment stretching back often for generations jointly in decisions that can affect the life outcomes for them and their families. For me, local knowledge is an incredibly valuable and rich source of information about how our natural environment might be changing. We as scientists, I believe, overlook such knowledge at our peril. That's not to say that we should unquestioningly accept everything that we hear from local sources about environmental change. Equally, we should not unquestioningly accept everything that we read from researchers published in peer-reviewed academic journals about environmental change. I believe that we need to question each source of knowledge the same and accept and respect each source of knowledge the same as well. And when we do that, we often get unique combinations of knowledge that can help us to really understand what is happening to the world around us and what the dynamics of land degradation might actually be that we're trying to tackle. Local communities often have experience of environmental change that they can tell us about over individual lifetimes and sometimes over generations from families and communities who have lived in a particular place. Many of these communities can tell us about how they have successfully coped with and adapted to enormous extremes of climatic variability, many of which we are likely to see more of under climate change. And these changes in climate are of course likely to interact with changes in the land that have been exacerbated by the way in which we are managing that land, often unsustainably. And it's this 
twin challenge of climatic change and land degradation that I believe poses some of the greatest challenges that we will face as humankind over the next hundred years. Talking to local people for me is incredibly valuable when it comes to land degradation because these people very often can tell us a huge amount about how to identify changes in the natural environment, giving us indicators and signs that we can use to monitor environmental change over time. They can help adapt old ideas that may have worked in the past for them, combining that with scientific knowledge perhaps, to make that fit for their purposes now in terms of both tackling land degradation and preventing further uh, negative changes to their land. And of course then we need to understand what is actually the best option for this group versus that group in this location versus that location at this time or that time. And I believe that it is of crucial importance that we engage with the communities who are affected by land degradation to make choices that meet their needs and their priorities. So in my PhD research, I combined knowledge from local pastoralists living in the Kalahari Desert with scientific knowledge about how we might be able to tackle some of these really challenging issues raised by land degradation. In this part of the world, one of the key challenges is thorny bush encroachment, caused by overgrazing by cattle in particular, which leads to a dominance first of unpalatable grass species, uh, followed then by the encroachment of these thorny bushes, which of course are not palatable to the cattle. Uh, these may indeed be palatable for goats and other small stock species, but in this part of the world uh, the culture is all about uh, the, the, the cattle uh, rather than the small stock, and so there are cultural barriers that prevent people from shifting uh, from one species of livestock uh, to the other. I wanted to understand with these people uh, what their understanding of environmental change was and when it became problematic for them, in particular when it affected their livelihoods and their ability to earn money and support their families through livestock production. Partly this was about understanding indicators that people could very easily use themselves without needing you know, expert equipment and training and such like. And partly it was about coming up with new ways of tackling these problems based on old and new local knowledge combined with scientific understanding of those processes. Many of these ideas uh, were quite new to people. Some of them were perhaps out of reach. For example, scientific means of tackling bush encroachment based on uh, the use of herbicides, which are very expensive. But we tried to develop a range of different options which varied in uh, their capital expenditure versus the amount of human resources that you needed to make them work. So for example, at the other end of the spectrum, you have techniques for uprooting and stem cutting and using various uh, chemicals that people easily have to hand, such as diesel, to try and prevent uh, regrowth of those bushes. Different techniques, different knowledges, different uses. And when you talk to the people in these environments, there is a real thirst to not only understand what they might be able to learn from the scientific community, but to understand their collective knowledge as a community about how that environment is changing, how, how they can work together as a community, potentially with researchers, to come up with new ways of tackling these problems. this up uh, by working with colleagues from around the world to try and see if it was possible to combine local and scientific knowledge in this way, not just in the Kalahari in Botswana, but in many different environments around the world suffering from very different types of land degradation, ranging from forest fire to salinization, as well as wind and water erosion. The list goes on. 
we need to find new ways in using and managing our land. So we are aware that we need people from different backgrounds to really make a change. And to do that, we have brought people together from different backgrounds uh, in a project which is called DESIRE. And together we would like to explore the new possibilities to better use our lands and to reduce the risks of continued desertification and at the same time increase livelihood possibilities of people living in these affected areas. Farmers are part of the evaluation on site because they are involved in the research activities and the testing of different land use management strategies. And so they are basically giving feedback continuously in the desertification hotspot sites where we are working. I think the project Desire has a strong interlinkation between the academic and the land in si. Uh, e o que nos, para nós é muito bom porque nos traz o saber que está no, no mundo académico. What we found in that work was that yes, it is possible to actually take a, a participatory process where you're trying to engage with these local knowledges um, and to come up with a variety of different options that people can then use to tackle these problems themselves. We brought in the scientific community to come up with ideas based on the latest evidence as well. And part of the scientific contribution of this work was to use models to try and upscale the findings that we had at a local scale to a more landscape scale. To say, well, you know, we think that this kind of technique might work well on a field scale. But actually, when you uh, span, expand that up to an entire landscape, you discover, well, there are parts of that landscape where this is going to work fantastically. Other parts of that landscape where, you know, it just wouldn't work. The soil isn't right, the slope isn't right, but also, actually, there are social barriers to this here. So, you know, there's one community of people here who culturally have no barriers to this. And another community over here that perhaps uh, don't economically have the means to get this new product to market because of the infrastructure. But if you're over here, it's dead easy. So what we're recognizing here is that it's all very well coming up with options, but those options may actually operate and work very differently for different groups of people in different parts of the landscape. In some areas, wildfires are not a big problem because forests are recovering rapidly. In other areas, for instance in dryland areas, forest fires can lead to serious uh, negative effects because the environment will not recover. A good example is for instance Portugal. On a yearly basis, approximately 5,000 wildfires are taking place. O que aconteceu aqui foi o resultado de uma série de grandes incêndios florestais que teve a, ver, teve a ver com uma nova paisagem que nós construímos aqui durante o último século, que resultou da morte da agricultura e da invasão do território pela floresta de uma forma desordenada. Essa paisagem, com estas condições climatéricas que aqui são normais, foi completamente insustentável e retundou numa enorme tragédia e, e num enorme desperdício de recursos. Que são exatamente o... que tragédia foi essa exatamente? A tragédia teve a ver com a perca eh, por parte de, da nossa população da sua fonte de subsistência, que nos últimas décadas foi a floresta, e com eh, o desaparecimento dessa fonte de subsistência, naturalmente agora estamos a perder a população. Neste momento são unicamente dois moradores, portanto, aqui na Aigra Velha. Portanto, neste momento somos só dois, eu e a minha esposa. Vai embora! Me lembro de uh, ver o conselho praticamente todo, todo queimado, não digo que fosse todo de uma vez, mas por várias etapas e durante vários anos. 
e depois há aquele, aquele receio de pessoas que por vezes até gostariam de vir passar umas férias à aldeia onde nasceram, mas eu não vou para lá que tenho medo do fogo, porque há um incêndio, aquilo, há tanto mato roda da aldeia que, que eu tenho medo de que haja um incêndio. Temos aqui um exemplo do que pode ser feito para prevenir os incêndios florestais, com a criação de algumas faixas de redução de vegetação, sem vegetação, para diminuir a capacidade de combustível e limitando ou diminuindo o risco de incêndio. Existe também a técnica de fogo controlado, que consiste na redução do combustível através da técnica de fogo e que tem vindo a ser utilizada por ser uma técnica de baixo custo e que tem efeitos na melhoria da, da própria vegetação e que é apenas utilizada segundo algumas condições climatéricas durante o outono, a primavera, quando não apresenta um elevado risco de incêndio. And this is why we need to engage local communities in decisions about which options would suit them most effectively. In my PhD research and in the DESIRE project, we use a tool called multi-criteria evaluation, which Nico is going to describe in more depth. Here are some images of me doing this in the Kalahari Desert. Uh, a quite basic version of this where we're simply uh, creating lots of options and then giving people a, num a certain number of stones which they can then use to vote for different options. In the Desire project we used more sophisticated tools that enabled us to look at a range of different criteria for each of those different options and then we could weight them using computers and then in real time display the results to the participants to say well it looks like as a group this is your favorite option. Let's discuss this. Could this really work? For me, these kinds of tools are really powerful ways of structuring very complex decision-making processes in ways which are as fair as possible to as many people as possible, so that everyone feels they've had a say in the decision. And that even if you don't necessarily agree with the outcome, you're more likely to say, well, you know what? I can live with that. I'm going to conclude by showing you some of the findings from research that I've done with colleagues around the world where we've analysed the participatory process that we used in the DESIRE project to see uh, how replicating a process in very, very different environments actually works. Now, when you take a participatory process and you try and do it in Russia or China uh, or in Crete, for example, does it work very differently because uh, the social dynamics, the, the cultural dynamics, uh, the kind of environment we're working in is just so radically different? Then what we did was we zoomed into two of those countries that we'd worked in, uh, Spain and Portugal. And we said, right, uh, let's keep the kind of the location, the environment pretty much similar. So we're going to look at dryland degradation in Spain, we're going to look at forest degradation in Portugal. But this time, let's look at some very different types of participatory process. Let's look at processes that were pretty much top-down. Yeah, this is what's going to happen, we'll tell you a bit about it, we might get some feedback, we might do something with it, but probably not a lot. Yeah? So, so really, yeah, not that much in the way of real engagement with the people who might be affected by these new ideas and new ways of managing the land. And we then took a sliding scale where we then looked at projects which were really heavily participatory, where people were engaged right from the outset, saying, you know what, we, as a community, have got a problem, and we want some help to solve this problem. This is what we need, this is what we want, this is where we want it, this is our knowledge, these are our ideas, now let's work together to see if we can make something happen on this. And we tried to find out, well, you know, what is the most important thing that determines whether a participatory process will work or not. Does it really matter where you do that participatory process or is it more about how you conduct that process? Well, of course it matters where. Of course it matters if you have people who are apathetic, you've had terrible experiences of engaging with scientists, with governments, with other people who come out from outside to try and help them. Now, of course, it is challenging in places where people aren't used to having their opinions asked. They aren't used to working together. Uh, there are many, many contexts in which it will be difficult to engage with people effectively. 
But when we look across the piece, what I think is fascinating about this research is that it shows that pretty much no matter how challenging the environment, there are certain things that, if you do right, are likely to make your participatory process actually achieve its goals in terms of land degradation and in terms of the things that the people who come into your process really want to achieve for them and for their community. What makes participation work? As a society, we all depend on our natural environment to provide us with vital resources such as food and water and a stable climate. What happens to the environment affects us all, so we should all, in theory, have a chance to participate in major decisions about how the environment is managed. But giving everyone a chance to have their say and influence these decisions is easier said than done. When you bring people together, there will always be disagreements, and some people worry that no one will take their views seriously. To overcome these and other challenges, you have to think really carefully about how to engage people in decisions that might affect them. Well-designed participation can result in fairer, more durable decisions that have better outcomes for the environment and for everyone involved. Every decision involves very different issues and people, so it's important to approach each situation differently if you really want to get people engaged in a decision. And that complicates things. But what if we could identify the most important secrets of success that can help people get involved and shape decisions no matter who or where they are or what they're interested in? It's a bit like a bike. To get to your destination in the city, a road bike will be most effective. But if your destination lies at the end of a muddy track, the chances are that a mountain bike will get you there faster. Both bikes are adapted to a particular environment, but they have the same key design elements. Two wheels, a frame, pedals and a chain. In the Involves project, we isolated the key elements that you need to get people effectively engaged in decisions that affect them, whether the road to your decision is a busy highway or a muddy track. We compared projects from around the world that engaged members of the public and other interested parties in decisions about the natural environment, and we found that no matter where in the world these projects operated, there were a small number of key design elements that made these processes successful, leading to better results for the natural environment and participants who learned from each other and trusted each other more than they ever did before. There are three things you need to get right if you want to engage people effectively in decision-making processes. A diverse group of well-informed people from different backgrounds will provide the most relevant and innovative ideas. There are two parts to this. First, you've got to identify the most relevant individuals and organisations who can represent the full range of interests. You need both creative minds and at least some people with power and means to implement decisions. You then need to bring these people to the table. This is about effective communication. How can you make getting involved seem attractive and easy and make it clear that they will directly benefit? Developing a set of ambitious but achievable goals can help demonstrate that participation will make a real difference, building on existing contacts and networks where you can. Creating an open and respectful environment needs to start at the very beginning and continue throughout people's engagement with your process. There's no point in having the right people around the table if some dominate and others feel powerless to speak. Make sure everyone is empowered to speak openly and be listened to equally. Using a professional and independent facilitator can really help. They can manage conflicts as they arise, and they often have tools that can help you get lots of information from people very quickly for them to think about critically together. Field visits to the places that decisions are being made about can also help create an atmosphere of trust and can increase engagement from all individuals in the group. Make it relevant for people to engage with your work. 
use language that they're familiar with, and activities that will make them feel comfortable in locations that they're familiar with and that are easy to get to. Take the decision to them in their village hall, rather than asking them to come to you. When you're dealing with something complex, try and focus on the aspects that are most tangible to people that might affect their daily lives. Negotiate from the outset what everyone wants to get out of the process and keep your eyes fixed on these goals the whole time. Make it clear how those who engage can influence decisions and how this can change their world. Our research shows that when you design for engagement, you can get new, creative and well-informed solutions that solve real-world problems. There are just a few important things you need to get right. A well-designed process will foster a sense of trust between all those affected and will make them feel an increased level of ownership over the problems and the proposed solutions. As a result, decisions are more likely to be accepted and implemented on the ground. The evidence also shows that the people you engage with will take valuable lessons away from their experience and develop new networks and alliances that they can benefit from for many years to come. Find out more about how to generate and share new ideas more effectively with the people you work with and share your thoughts with us on Twitter or on our website.